Hello, everyone. Welcome to Smoke the Podcast, episode 18. Well, today should be a good one. Yes. As they all are. <laughs> <laughs> At least we think. We pick these topics out, obviously, because it's things that we want to talk about. Right. Um, so, uh, Ryan, you want to get us started on the, the cigar we're smoking today? Yeah. So today, uh, we're actually smoking a very special cigar, um, brought all the way back from Ecuador um, by my mother. Uh, so thank you, Mom, for that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, so these are Cohibas. Um, they are Robusto in size. Um, and they are legitimate Cuban cigars. Wow. Yeah. So that's that's going to knock me on my butt, I think. Yeah, it might. <laughs> it, the, even though they're small, I mean, these things are pretty powerful. So, um, yeah, they're, they're pretty cool. We don't really know a whole lot about them. Um, if you want to look on Cohiba's website, um, in regards to just general Cuban cigars, they're usually considered full-bodied cigars, medium at the, the lightest is like a medium. Typically they're pretty full-bodied cigars. Every Cuban cigar I've ever smoked, I feel like has been quite a bit stronger than, than the rest of the cigars that, that we typically smoke. So I don't know why that is. Um, and I don't know if I'd feel the same way if I smoked them all the time. I, I don't know, but they seem to just be uh, pretty, pretty tough, tough cigars to get yeah. through. But delicious, though. Uh, they, those of you that listen know that we're kind of lean towards the mild um, end of the spectrum as far as strength is concerned. Um, <laughs> th these are pretty flavorful. They are. Yeah. They're really good. Um, I'm a little scared of that though, because my tendency will be to <laughs> like try and smoke it as yeah fast as I can. But. Yeah, um, we'll keep the sugar on standby yeah. for anybody that doesn't know that uh, little pro tip. Oh yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you're getting a little bit of a nicotine sickness, um, just take a eat a, the, a lot of the guys ta actually carry sugar cubes. Yeah, sugar cubes are just get some sugar in your system. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that'll help you with that. Yep. Pretty pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, and what whiskey are we drinking today? Um, so as Ryan was talking about the cigar, I went ahead and poured. Um, today we're drinking Samuel Grant uh, Kentucky Straight Bourbon. Uh, the description we have is from the Booze Blog. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool name. Yeah. Um, so it says uh, Samuel Grant uh, is a house brand sold at uh, Safeway and Vons um, in the vein of their bottom shelf rum, vodka, and tequila. But I thought, hey... For 10 bucks, how bad uh, could a vintage cask bourbon be? Answer, not bad at all. Hmm. Uh, I have yet to taste it personally. Yeah, I've, I've had it. <laughs> uh, the bottle is not unlike the Evan Williams bottle, <coughs> uh, which this bourbon outshines. It's a young-tasting, astringent bourbon <laughs> for its uh, elderly title, uh, but calms down to a citrus beginning cream soda finish, uh, given a little air. Uh, it makes it good old-fashioned. I personally like old fashions. Me too. <laughs> and it got me through the Thanksgiving, for which I am eternally grateful. Summary, better than Evan Williams Black. Great deal if you find yourself shopping at Vons or Safeway, depending on where you are, uh, and see it on sale. Uh, fun fact, too. I got it at Albertsons because they are owned <laughs> by Vons and Safeway. <laughs> um, so this particular um, whiskey doesn't have a website since yeah, it, yeah it's kind of yeah you know uh, sold, sold by von safeway company a house brand um, yeah uh, it's 80 proof uh, 40 percent alcohol by volume uh, typical price 11.99 for seven milliliter and 750 750 sorry <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um i'm sure you can uh, find it on sale for cheaper yeah and the rating from uh, the booze blog was a seven out of ten yeah uh, which, for being a bottom shelf... That's, uh, like, pretty good. Yeah. <clears throat> so, typically, for me, a unique fact on this is this is what I would, like, consider a really easy and cheap mixing bourbon. So, it's really great if you're going to make, like, a um, bourbon and cola or, you know, really any bourbon and sweet tea, I guess. I um, ho hopefully, this <laughs> uh, outshines the 75 South. South. Oh, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that was horrible. Don't even talk about it. Um, There's still some in the cabinet. I'm gonna hit in my fact, first. It's almost a whole bottle left. I'm so. gonna hit my first sip. So uh, cheers. Cheers. Oh wow, that's actually pretty good. Yeah, it's actually pretty good. It's not bad at all. <clears throat> um, it definitely does have a cream soda finish. Yeah, 
it, yeah, it does. I can taste that. Um, and yeah, if if you put me in a blind taste test with some some higher end bourbons, I don't know if I would be able to pick this one out as a cheap one, personally. Yeah. Um, that being said, you know I'm not a bourbon aficionado, so um, you know my I've said this before, my palate's not as sophisticated. Right. So you know that might not not be saying much, but. If you put 75 South in that same thing, <laughs> I'd be able to that pick that one out. That rotten corn flavor or whatever it was. I would be able to pick was. that one out really easily. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think for me, I've, I don't know that I've really ever drank this straight. It's always been something that I've either mixed or, um, yeah, really just, just mixed. And so it's kind of interesting to be able to, to taste it straight. It's really good, actually. Um, I know you said it's like a, an initial a citrus uh, flavor and then it comes down to the the cream soda. I, I don't really taste a whole lot of the citrus in there personally, um, but I definitely tasted more of like a cream soda finish on there. Um, and I do understand what he's saying by the astringent uh, kind of alcohol taste to it, because um, it it they claim to be this like vintage cask air, barrel old whiskey, but yeah, it, it definitely doesn't taste like it's aged all that long. It's it it's a little bit yeah, harsher I, I on the it. initial sip. Yeah, I, I mean I'm getting a little bit of citrus um, up front right at the beginning, but other I get than that, I get a little bit of the citrus off the um, aroma, but um, you know what's funny is I I feel like the aroma is very very faint. It's not it's not very powerful at all. Yeah, it's not as strong as some of the other ones where you're like, whoa, I can pick out like distinct notes. Um, I do think it. It coincidentally pairs well with the Cohiba because <laughs> um, I feel like this is a very aged, aged cigar. Um, it's got a lot of depth and a lot of flavor to it. You can smell all the different notes in the smoke and everything else, and it's kind of nice to have a somewhat mellow um, <laughs> yeah. bourbon to go with that. Um, so. so let's move on okay. to our, our triggered topic this, of the day. Yeah, this is a big topic. Yes. So we may uh may go a little long on this one or we may even have to continue some of the parts later. So. Um yes. <laughs> so today's uh, trigger topic is concealed carry in California. Yep. Um probably just going to talk about how to obtain a CCW um in California at least in the counties that we live in. Yeah, or the ones around us. Um yeah. Yeah, so to today's topic is is it's pretty uh pretty self-explanatory in the fact that this is all stuff that essentially you could go online and pretty much research yourself. So what we're going to be telling you here is is basically verbatim or regurgitated from what I was able to find online and what Theodore was able to find online as well. So none of this stuff is really secret. Um, but it does kind of help to know the process if you have not been through the process. Yes. So. Um, it, it's With California, it's always tough um, because you hear a lot of mixed things, um, especially if you're in uh, L.A. County or, yeah. you know, an, another, you know, pretty liberal county. Yeah. Um, so it, it's going to be really tough to get a CCW. In other counties, it's it's a little easier which kind of makes it confusing. So if you get, from my understanding, a CCW in a CCW license, that's good for all of California, regardless yeah. of the county that you obtain it in. Right, yes. Um, and that is how it works. It's a permit for the entire state of California. However, you do have to get it from typically, um, I should say typically, you have to get it from the sheriff's department within your county. Okay. Now, also, to my understanding, and unfortunately, I don't live in a city where this is the case, so I didn't, I, I didn't, I haven't experienced anything like this, and don't know anyone who has. Some of the county sheriff's departments will outsource the processing to local PD, so city PD, or okay. or things like that. And I do know that, in, in particular, in Riverside County, that they do outsource to some of the further desert cities. Um, because it is a little tough for some of those citizens to be driving two hours to, you know, um, do some of the things like the interviews and training and stuff like that. So they allow um, the local PDs out in the further areas of the county to issue their own. Okay, so California is a may issue state, correct? Yes. And um, that is opposed to a shall issue state? Right. Um, you want to go over the differences? 
So a may issue state, it's exactly what it sounds like. They may or they may not okay. issue you a, uh, a CCW. There are some states that they call shall issue, which they believe as long as you're eligible to possess and purchase and own a firearm, then they'll issue you a CCW. So if, those, if you ask for one. Those would be like uh, Arizona's a shell issue? Uh, yeah, but I actually think... Well, I'm not... In, yeah, I think Arizona is a shell issue. But also in Arizona, they allow you to conceal carry without a permit, uh, provided you're a a homeowner and a, and eligible to carry a firearm, okay. right? So on in a state like that, or I believe Wyoming is one of these states where they're considered like a just a second amendment state. Um, where you don't necessarily even need a permit to carry. It's yeah, as lawful. long as you're a resident. Yeah, as long as you're a resident and have an ID card and can eligibly own firearms, then um, you're good to go. Okay, so in California, um, what are some of the requirements? Well, um, so in California, um, just the state requirements, some of the basic state requirements, um, number one is that licenses can only be issued to residents here. Okay. You can't get an out-of-state permit. Um or a non-resident permit. You have to be, I, I know one of the sites that I found said over 18 years of age, but we know in California that you can't even possess a handgun until you're over 21 years of age. Yeah. Um, so 21 years is, and most of the local sheriff's department require 21 years of age. Um, the applicant also has to be of good moral character. Um, that's very uh, subjective, I guess. <laughs> um and then good cause exists to issue the concealed carry weapon license. So you need to have good cause in order to carry here, which is why it's a may issue state rather mm -hmm. than a shall issue state. Because in a shall issue state, you could say, well, it's my right or I want to you know, practice the right of self-defense and this and that. And so then they just give it to you. Here, you actually need to have good cause and that has to exist and, and make sense. Um, and then you also have to do uh, training prescribed by the licensing authority. Um, which now in the state of California, I believe it, it has to be no less than eight hours um, of firearm training for any new CCW holders, um, and then no less than four hours for renewals. So every, every time you renew, you have to take a four-hour course. Now you're going to ask me probably the next question is how long are they valid for, and it's two years. So every two years, you have to take a four-hour refresher course. And wow. I believe you even have to requalify as well. Okay, that's uh, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty in depth, especially when you consider some states will just allow you to carry just for being a resident. Yeah. Um, and then some states, you know, it's like they they'll give you a permit, but then you can carry whatever you want. You don't have to go down to the range or do anything. You know. Yeah. So the qualification, uh, meaning that you're going to have to qualify with the gun or guns you're going to be carrying. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Um, so yeah, you'll, you will have to qualify with any of the guns you choose to carry. And I believe the limit on that for all of the state is either th six or three. I know particular, well, it must be for the state because, yeah. um, I know Riverside allows up to six firearms to be listed. Um, I don't know. Some, some counties only allow one or two or three. Um, but yeah, in, in Riverside they're, they're, they're pretty uh, relaxed it's kind of <laughs> like the wild west which yeah, is awesome the wild west uh, for california uh-huh <laughs> um yeah because i know uh, in other states there really is no you can carry if you have a concealed carry license you can just conceal carry right yeah yeah <laughs> you don't have to have a serial number yeah attached to it or anything uh -uh, like that. or caliber restraints or yeah. anything like that so um, so it's about what, $350 in estimated costs. Yeah. And we'll go into deep detail here in just a moment on the cost. Cause I think it's important to consider the cost before, okay. <laughs> before even getting started. Um, and the processing time. So is this from the beginning of application to receiving your CCW license? This is from the moment you contact them to receiving okay. your license. Um, it can be anywhere from 90 days in counties like Riverside, where they've streamlined things, but it can also take as long as two plus, three plus, or even four plus years. Wow. Yes. That is yes. a long time. Yes. So, um, just to state this and get this out there, I have known people who were on waiting lists just to even have their initial appointment for over two years. Wow. 
Yeah. And then Do you know from, what counties they were from? That you know, they to? so Riverside was one of them, but there was a new sheriff that was elected at the beginning of this year. Oh, um, or a that new took sheriff term. in town, huh? Yeah, there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> um, and he is a definite Second Amendment supporter, which is amazing, and he has totally streamlined the process. So now you can get your CCW, to my understanding, in less than even 60 days, um, some, in some cases. Wow, that, um, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you know anybody in any other counties? Mm, San Bernardino, I believe. Um, I want to say, I know I had a friend there. That took about two years to get theirs. Um, and then I know after, for anyone who's familiar with California or even some of the recent um, news events in California, there was the San, Ber- San Bernardino shooting. Yes. Um, the active shooter incident there. Um, and it, it was actually pretty quick getting your CCW prior to that. And then after that incident, it just like slam their CCW unit because everyone in the county was like, oh my gosh, I, I want to protect myself. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get my CCW. Orange County is the same way. Um, I know that the wait times there were approximately one to two years for an initial meeting. Um, and then as far as LA County goes, I'm not super familiar. And honestly, I don't even know anyone who has their CCW in LA County who is not either law enforcement or private security or military yeah. or something of, of that nature. So... Um, yeah, time, time, time constraint can be crazy. It's always best to look at, um, Cal guns, um, the forums on Cal guns. There are guys on there all the time that are sharing their experiences going through the process. So I'll go ahead and go over some of the costs here. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the costs to consider, uh, assuming that you already have guns and, and gear to carry, uh, $95 to the California Department of Justice for a processing fee. Um, and that includes a live scan. It um, can. It, Okay. Some agencies, you'll pay that, and then uh-huh. they'll still charge you when you get to the oh. door to do the live scan. And live scans are anywhere between like fifteen to thirty dollars. Just uh, FYI, a <laughs> uh, hundred dollars. This is for the county of Riverside, um, yeah. so it would be different, uh, I guess, depending on the county that you're getting yep. it in. Yep. A uh, hundred plus dollars uh, for uh, training uh, range fees. Yep. And about fifty bucks for ammo. Yep. Um, so the total cost about three hundred and fifty plus. <laughs> yeah. I would say about at least three hundred and fifty dollars. At, at least, I yeah. would say that's probably closer to the bare minimum. Um, I know Riverside charges that that hundred dollar fee that they charge us for administrative fee, and then to actually print out your permit and everything. Um, some places charge two three hundred dollars for the administration fees and wow. meetings and everything, because essentially you're paying for the background investigators' time and it all. I mean, it's insane. And then there were um, ranges, the training ranges. Um, their range, uh, Riverside County Sheriff's range, only charges a hundred dollars for the day for the eight-hour training course. Some places charge upwards of two, three hundred dollars for the eight-hour training course. So, well, yeah, yeah so you, you can really get into it for a good five, six hundred bucks almost. Oh, easily, yeah. As, again, assuming you don't have any firearms or gear then that tax on the price of a firearm. Yeah. And then most of these places require specific types of holsters in order to qualify. And if you don't have those holsters, now all of a sudden you have to go out and buy them and things like that. But we'll get on to that later. Okay, so. well, let's start with the application process then. Yeah. Um, we're going to do this mostly for the county of Riverside. Um, that's just because it's uh, a county that's a- around us. And, and we happen pretty to easy. know <laughs> someone who may or may not have gone through the process. <laughs> um so, yeah, you want to go ahead and get us started on that? Yeah, so with Riverside, it's kind of cool. Everything is done online now. Now, I don't know if that's the case for everywhere else. To my understanding, um, San Bernardino and L.A. County, and I'm not 100% sure on Orange County, but um, for sure I believe San Bernardino and L.A. County currently are doing everything still the old school way, which is handwritten paperwork, or you fill out the applications and, and take them in or send them in. Yeah, I, I did look uh, up L.A. County, and... It, it is, um, you know, like, like a PDF you yeah, have to download okay. and fill out and all that. So to give you an idea, um, that process takes quite a while. Um, and that under one, the old Riverside County Sheriff was taking about two years, um, a year and a half to two years just to get an appointment. And then about six months from the time you started your appointment to the time that you were supposedly being issued your permit. Um, now it's taking about 60 days because everything's done online. You're able to scan all of your documents and just submit everything online. So 
Um, there's a link on the Riverside County CCW page uh, with instructions. Again, there's probably a CCW page for any county that you look up in California. Um, I know for a fact in Southern California, San Bernardino, LA, Orange, I think Ventura, um, San Diego County all have websites that you can just log right into and, and check out their requirements. Um, the number one thing that I can tell you right off the bat before you even start the application is you need to be prepared to scan a lot of copies of personal documents. One of those being your um, California driver's license or state issued ID. Um, current county address is required too. So if you've okay. moved and you're like, oh, cool, now I'm in this new county and I want to, you know, and you haven't updated your driver's license, you need Go to do, do so that. because, yeah, <laughs> they won't even look get at it. All that done first. Yes, get all of that done first before you even try and apply. Um, they're going to want two of your most recent utility bills or any other sufficient proof of full time residency within the county. Um, and that doesn't mean last month's electric bill and this month's electric bill. It means this month's electric bill and this month's water bill yeah. or, you know, something to that effect. I believe a like rental agreement or something like that would work as well. Okay. Um, a birth certificate and or naturalization papers. Um, if you um, were in the military, they want a military discharge DD-214 form. Um, and then any CCW training certificates if you've already done the CCW training. I highly recommend not doing the training until you've gotten a certain amount into the process because it can be very expensive. And if they're just going to kick back your application yeah. for some reason, then you've spent a lot of money on nothing. So um, some counties require personal reference letters. Um, I know Riverside County used to require three personal reference letters. They could not be from your employer or any um, co-workers, I believe, and they could not be from any family members. So it had to be people that you knew either from past employment. I, I think what it was was no current um, okay. employment. Um, or, you know, family, friends, things were, you know, maybe they weren't related to you. Um, I know a lot of the guys would try and get, like, one dude from the military that they knew, one dude from law enforcement, mm -hmm. and like maybe a member of the clergy or. I was gonna say, man, I don't know anybody outside of work and family. <laughs> right, and that Good luck. And, and that's kind of the problem for some people, and that that's the whole point is they want to make it hard on you, yeah. and they want to kind of almost. I don't want to say that because I think Riverside is a really great county, and what they're doing is amazing. That that hey, if you're eligible to own, we want to give it to you. Riverside County is more of a shall issue county rather than a may issue county. Yeah. Um, I want to say the success rate is above ninety percent completion. As, oh wow! Assuming you have all the criteria. Yeah. Um, which is crazy. So that's that's super awesome. Um, but yeah, they some some counties require that, and then some require employment history and verification as well. Um, so yeah. And so that's, uh, just the, the county, uh, application? No, that, is, some of that is required for the California portion. Okay. So there's two applications typically that you'll have to figure out. Um, one of them is the Cal DOJ, which is the most important one. That's the California Department of Justice. Now, technically, I believe that's the only one that is legally required, um, in order to get the CCW. However, most counties, because they're the ones that are now taking the risk factor, um, they also require a lot of their own stuff too. So um, the personal reference letters and the employment history and verification, I believe, is, is county-based. Okay. Everything else, as far as uh, birth certificate, ID, all of that, that's all California-based. So the rule of thumb here is just have all of those documents ready to go, okay. along with any other important documents that you may think you may need. Because um, every, every county is going to be a little different. Um, so let's start first, though, with the Cal DOJ or the California Department of Justice application. Again, that's the main one. Um, and some of the counties are really relaxed on what they ask for in addition to this. Um, this one's going to be the most important. But number one, they're going to ask for the most basic information. I think the first two pages is just your name, address, you know, all your basic personal info, driver's license, all that stuff. Then they're going to ask you some clearance questions. Clearance questions pertain to whether you've been arrested, whether you've had had traffic violations, restraining orders, um, domestic violence, whether you've been denied a CCW before, whether you have a CCW with any other states or agencies or anything like that. Um, so once you're done filling out all of that, if you do have any of those things, it's not an automatic decline. Um, so they won't automatically reject you if you do have 
um, something like that, assuming it's cleared or the proper amount of time has passed, you personally should know whether or not you're eligible to own firearms. And we've yeah. talked about that, I believe, with the DOJ form for the ammo and, and stuff like that. Um, so if you're cleared to own, chances are you're probably okay on that, okay. that portion. Um, then next they're going to ask for a description of all the weapons. So you uh, have up to six that are allowed. Um, they're going to ask you for the make, the model, the serial number, and the caliber. Um, be sure that each firearm you are listing is registered to you or your spouse if you're married. Okay. Because um, that's the only way it can be transferable yeah. um, when it comes to handguns. I know long guns can be transferred from father to son or mother to daughter, that sort of a thing. Um, but when it comes to handguns, even if your father passes a handgun down to you, you do still have to re-register that handgun. Yeah, and this is where it, it becomes um, where you got to follow the laws, you know. Uh, a lot of people don't want to register their stuff, uh, but if you want to do something like this, you're going to have to. Um, right. Or yeah. else you can get in trouble. The, the the thing is, is, you know, if you get pulled over and you have a weapon on you and you have your CCW permit and it's not listed on there, you know, then... You might as well Yeah, you might be, as well not even have it. Yeah, yeah. You might as well be carrying a felony with you wherever yeah. you go, essentially, is the way they look at it. Okay. So once that's done um, and you write down all the, the descriptions of the weapons, then there's some documentation in there pertaining to you know, the laws of carrying and, and different penal codes and stuff like that. It's just a lot that you can read through. Next, you'll find in, in the application a section called the interviewer's notes, um, and that's for the investigator. This is one of the biggest sections of the application. This, again, they're going to ask you about domestic violence, um, any arrests, any incidents, any gun-related incidents, um, any if you've been involved in any fights or have lost your temper before, they want to see, you know, how rash of a person you are. Um, they want to know whether or not you've been addicted to any substances or alcohol, if you have any mental illness, that sort of thing. And um, they do ask you quite a few questions. If you can answer no on everything, awesome. If not, they give you an area to explain, you know, why, um, why, why not, all that. They want to know. Um, again, any traffic violations you've had, moving violations, things like that, and uh, any, any, I think, car accidents as well. Um, so there's there's a lot of stuff there, um, and, and it's basically just a general idea of, you know, trying to figure out whether or not you are a person of good moral character, which is kind of what was mentioned as one of the yeah. requirements. So after you fill all of that out, you have what's called the good cause statement. So you need to provide a statement showing good cause for you to essentially get this permit. And that is what, in my interpretation, is the most important part, right? It, <laughs> this, it, this is going yes. to pretty much determine whether, assuming that you, you pass everything else, I mean, um, like Ryan had mentioned before, you, you pretty much know whether you, you can probably right. uh, get it or not. You kind of have a good idea. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be, um, I think, where they're, they're trying to weed out... Uh, people depending on their answer here um, yeah. I, I to me the good cause statement is why california is a, a may issue state as opposed to a shell issue state um, i think this is where the people that are eligible this is where california can say yeah you know i didn't like that answer yes so. <laughs> yes the local county will say it too i mean it's not just the california yeah. thing but um yeah so this is kind of the make or break for you um, it, definitely, I think without a good cause, um, you can, you can easily be denied and you need to be extremely specific too when providing your good cause. Um, it's really tough. I know, um, when some people are coming up with their good cause, they want to ask everybody, you know, oh, what did you put down for your good cause? And, and that's a good thing, but a good cause statement is truly more about you as the individual. Because what might work for some per some people might not work for the next person, you know, especially if it's business related or if it's hobby related and you don't fall into a lot of those same categories, uh -huh. it may be easier for you just to uh, blanket statement, you know. Yeah. And that's not what they're looking for by any means. They're looking for something definitely a lot more specific. Yeah. Why do you need to yes. uh, why carry you, a gun? Yes. You versus anybody else out there. You know, what what's... What is your purpose for it? And so um, the one nice thing I will say, and I don't know if it's the same for every county, but in Riverside, um, they do tend to read through your statement and let you know, hey, you, you, you got to revise this, or it would sound better if you said this, this, and this, or I know what you were trying to get at, so why don't you go back and rephrase it so it says these specific things. 
Okay. Which is pretty, That's pretty cool. helpful. Yeah. Um, so, with that said, what are some uh, good causes? Why? So, uh, why would California grant someone a CCW license? So I'm going to bring this up first because I think it's one of the most important, but it's also one of the stickiest reasons. And, and number one would be business, right? Yes. If you work in a in an industry like uh, let's say construction or real estate or in legal um, the legal field or or uh, even financial field. Um, oftentimes you're going to be put in situations where maybe you might be in either rough areas or, um, working odd hours or carrying large sums of money, financial information, that sort of thing. Um, it can be one of those things where that can be the thing that helps you the most. Um, the reason why it can get sticky though, is if you are doing it specifically for that business and that business alone, they may require business verification and there's a whole nother uh, additional um, like application that you have to fill out for, okay. for businesses. Um, that being said, it is kind of nice for people who are like, let's say in real estate or even construction where you're working more as an independent contractor rather than as a business, you know? And yeah. so maybe you own your own business. Then at that point, it's super easy to say, oh, well, I own my own business. I'm, I'm out, you know, let's say showing properties every mm -hmm. day or I'm at open houses or I'm working in really rough areas of Los Angeles yeah. where my um, expensive work equipment could be stolen or, you know, my laptop contains hundreds of social security numbers for all of my clients and things like that. And a lot of people don't think of that. They think, well, shoot, I don't carry large sums of money. I'm not, you know, going back and forth and dropping off cash everywhere. But what people don't realize is now at days in the digital age, having a ton of credit card numbers and account numbers and social security numbers is almost more valuable than having a bag of cash. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, people are always looking for that kind of data nowadays, especially, you know, criminals. Um, so they can exploit, uh, so they exploit people well, with their personal information. 100%. And then, like I said, that, that also goes along the lines of a lot of the times people don't realize this, but if you work in, let's say a, um, a trade industry and you have tons of tools. I mean, it, it, you don't think about it because you're typically not yeah. buying all your tools at once. You're buying it over the lifetime of your career or over a few years. And now all of a sudden you look back and you go, oh my gosh, my entire truck carries, you know, $10,000 worth of tools at, at any given time, yeah. at least not to mention all the product I'm carrying, mm -hmm. not to mention keys and access to all of these buildings. Yes. Um, and, and where there's even more stuff that can be, you know, taken from. And then, um, just, we see it all the time too, where people are, are, um, like for example, realtors is one of the most dangerous jobs, um, as far as people being robbed, assaulted and things in vacant homes and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Cause you're with people that you don't really don't know yeah, by yourself yeah. in a, in an enclosed area. Well, and then I brought up the legal field because oftentimes if you're fighting cases back and forth, you have a lot of very irate parties that yeah. you're dealing with. If you lose a case or you win a case, then you might have someone who's disgruntled on one side or the other. And, um, people don't think rationally when their life is kind of crashing down mm -hmm. around them. And so having the ability to protect yourself in those situations is really important as well. Yeah. So, um, that's why I bring it up as being one of the most important, but again, it can get sticky if you work for a large firm and then they want to know, well, does your, is your firm okay with you carrying mm -hmm. or are you, is your, you know, the corporate office okay with this and that, and, and that's where it can kind of get a little sticky, but the other good one um, to use is whether or not, and this is what our show is about, whether you're a hunter, an angler, an outdoorsman, or shooting sports enthusiast. That would, uh, I could check that box on all of those, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not um, very good at any of them, but. <laughs> uh, what do they say? A, a, a jack of all trades, but yeah, a master of none. Definitely a master of none for me. Um, but, you know, hey, I, I, still, I still partake. And again, when you're listing this, uh, you don't want to just say, oh, well, I hunt. Yeah. You know, you want to be very specific. You, you want to provide very, very specific details. Well, I hunt in remote areas with limited access to cell phones or reception or Wi-Fi. Uh -huh. um, it would take the police a long time to respond to my particular location, or I might not even be able to be found um, in, in a certain amount of time. Um, you know, whether or not you transport firearms and ammunition. That's a big one for anyone who goes out hunting or anyone who does shooting sports out in the desert in BLM land. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times I've driven with five, six, seven plus firearms in my car with oh, yeah. thousands of rounds of ammunition to go out to the desert, you know? And, you know, things we've touched on in a couple of other episodes, when you're out on BLM land searching for, you know, chucker or, 
or quail, you know, you might run into somebody doing some uh, illicit activities out there, yes. like, you know, maybe growing drugs, yeah. <laughs> growing marijuana. I mean, that's a kind of a uh, thing that that's happened out there in, in remote areas, you know, so you got to be able to protect yourself yeah. um, from just accidentally running up on something that you're not prepared for. Well, and in, in, in that same spirit too, from wild animals as well. Yeah. I mean, I don't, especially if like, let's say you're hiking with, with pets like dogs, right? You know, I have, I have two dogs and I'm constantly out, you know, we're out walking with the dogs and we've run across everything from, you know, small game to coyotes to, you know, I'm sure someday I, well, I know I've personally walked and hiked, um, near, uh, uh bears, um, yeah. up in the Sierras, uh, bobcats, um, I've never seen a uh, mountain lion in a position where I thought like, oh man, this is not good, but from a distance and things like that. And it only takes one time for them to get close enough. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Mountain lions you are know. not something you want to mess with. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad um, that I haven't had to deal with that. But I mean, and even bears as docile as they can be, yeah. um, can turn on you in just a moment's notice too. So yeah. What it comes down to wild animals, a wild animal. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. You just never know what they're going to do. Um, and then the other thing too, is oftentimes when we're out there and I know we've, we've encountered this too, is, you, you know, you encounter different like transients, homeless people, um, uh, suspicious persons mm-hmm. is a way that they say to phrase it, but that could be, you know, someone who's, you know, maybe on, on drugs out in the middle of the desert, you know, freaking out or whatever. And, um, definitely seen that while out dove hunting down in Nyland and yeah. some of those rougher areas down in, uh, the Salton Sea. Yeah. So that that's one of those things where you would want to utilize that um all of those reasons you know okay. for it and and you can you can utilize every single one of those um another good one too is um if you tend to do a lot of camping or backwoods stuff all, again all of those kind of fall into place mm-hmm. what i recommend is take the general because we're talking about you can't use anything general take the general and make it specific to you okay yeah, that makes that, sense. That's the easiest way to say yeah. it is because, yes, the reason at the end of the day, the reason is always the same. Well, I would like to protect myself. Yeah. From what is the question? From what exactly? You know, what are you most likely to encounter? Yeah. So you want to give your own personal answers. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then last but not least, uh, another big, big uh, topic for the good cause Um this one is good if you have other reasons. Um, it's always good to tack this on, but increased crime. Give examples of recent, and I mean recent, within the last couple months, um, local violent crimes. Um, so either shootings, stabbings, murders, um, rapes, uh, sexual assaults, carjackings, robberies, anything that would be considered a violent crime. Yeah. Um, and you can even use the, the city block or street or, or, you know, who was injured, how many people were injured, that sort of a thing. Yeah, and this, someone was this day and age of social media should be easy to find. Some, yeah, some and crime. again, the person that we know that may or may not have just gone through the process recently um, listed a shooting that happened in his neighborhood um, where a woman was killed. Okay. And that was literally like a month uh, prior to submitting the good cause statement. So, um, another thing to bring up as well is the increase in mass shootings. I mean, we're just seeing that on the news all over the place. So you can say, look, I, uh, frequent malls, movie theaters, restaurants, um, a lot of these public places where these things happen and you can feel free to cite specific cases where these have happened. Yeah. Um, and I would just like to protect myself and my family, yes. um, in the event of a shooting. Uh, do you think maybe, they they would be a little more sympathetic if you said you know uh, I I have a family to protect you mm-hmm. know and I have kids yes or you know I, me personally I take my nieces <clears throat> out to a lot of places and you know right. I want to be able to protect them also so at the time when I <clears throat> knew this person who <laughs> submitted theirs uh, they were only just married and yeah. weren't expecting any children but circumstances tend to change very rapidly yeah so. Uh, this person now has a family to future family to be worried about. So, um, so that does look good on your application. It does. In fact, that was something that was mentioned, um, by that investigator to, to that person. Hey, look, uh, you know, do you have kids? No. Okay. Well, are you planning on having kids? Yes. Okay. You need to mention that, you know, I want to protect my family, my future family, you know, like that sort of a thing. It's if you have kids, if you have nieces, nephews, anyone that you can list that you tend to frequently go out with or hang out with, yeah, that 100% um, 
Um, cause then that gives you more of a reason if it's just yourself and you're a man who let's say is six, five and they think, well, he could probably handle himself without a firearm. They'll be less likely to give it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um is, is there any, anything that you would not use on your good cause? 100%. Statement? Yes. <laughs> Phrases like, because it is my right to do so. Okay. I know, I know, I know. That makes like the the skin of Second Amendment or crawl. Like, go, well, yeah, it is my right. You yes. Know? Or another statement that you don't want to use. Well, the Second Amendment allows me to do so. Yeah. Don't use statements like that. That is such an easy blanket statement. Um, here in California, it's great in places where they're like, absolutely, it is your right. It is the Second Amendment. Here you go. Congratulations. But here, they don't want to hear that at all. They don't want to hear it. It's just like one of the worst statements you could put in there. Another one that you could put in there is, well, I just want it for self-defense. That's just, it, it, that's too much of it's a blanket too big, statement. Yeah. 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 yeah, you're not giving any um, any details and how it would pertain to your life. Right. So that's, those are some things that 100% you want to avoid those. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, uh, you know, I would like to defend myself against all of the things that we just listed, but to say, well, it's my right to self-defense, or it's my right as an American, or it's my right because of the Second Amendment, it's probably not going to get passed. So, I mean, unless you're in, maybe, I know some counties up in, like, Northern California are pretty much like, oh, cool, you know, here you go, congratulations, but there are a lot of counties that are not that way, so you want to avoid those statements. So, Assuming you do all of that, complete your good cause, you sign at the bottom, and you're done with your DOJ application, so congratulations. <laughs> now you get to submit that. But wait, there's more. Um, you have a county or local application, depending on how, how your county or city breaks it up. Wow, they really do not make this easy. No, they don't. And um, this uh, cigar is extremely moist, which is why I'm having to like relight it, but it's delicious. So, for... Uh, I, I know the process of getting a um, non-resident Arizona CCW, <laughs> and I uh, the the person that may or may not have gotten that one, <laughs> <laughs> or the people, <laughs> or the people uh, went through a, a a course, filled out a um, uh, I, mean, I don't even know what it was. It was just a little a little application. It wasn't even a full page. I yeah. don't think it was and like then, a half page. Yeah, did a fingerprint thing. And to my understanding. Did a fingerprint, and then the CCW license came in the mail like a couple weeks later. Yeah, it was pretty simple. It was And the class, I think, within, was only like two hours. Yeah, within a couple hours. Yeah. Um, so it's a little different here. Um, it's, it's definitely, you have to work for it. I think that's what California kind of wants you to do. Yeah. They kind of want to make it difficult for you to be able to obtain it and yeah. maybe weed out the people that really just want it just to, you know... That, are, that, that want it but are not really, you know, going to go through the whole hassle of getting all this stuff done. Yeah. Um, so uh, you want to describe a little bit about what uh, the county application yeah. process looks like? So just I'll preface it with this. Each county will probably have mm -hmm. additional questions and will be a little different from, you know, each other. Some will probably ask more things. Some will probably be a little more relaxed. Again, Riverside is a little more relaxed, um, and I think a lot of the northern California counties are, are fairly relaxed yeah. on it. Um, but basically, the county application for some of the counties down here want to know your level of training. You know, when did you first learn to shoot a gun? Um, have you had any training courses? Uh, have you done anything, you know, to further your, your uh, education in firearms and, and, and carrying concealed, things like that? Um, they want to know whether or not, again, substance abuse, uh, mental health, arrests, uh, traffic records, court records. Um, they're looking a lot, again, at, you know, whether or not you uh, are a violent person, whether you, you, you lose your temper easily. Um, it, honestly, a lot of them are same, like similar questions to the DOJ application. And I think part of it is for consistency. They're looking to see, are you consistent across the board? Are you answering the same for every question? You know, and they'll phrase yeah. them slightly different, so that way it kind of causes you to sit there and go, well, I don't know, that one's phrased differently. I yeah. don't, you know, but at the end of the day, they're just looking for consistency, and um, oftentimes they want to have paperwork on file as well, and not just the DOJ. They want to have their own paperwork on file, so if something happens, they can refer back to it and say, well, we did this interview, and everything checked out at, at that point in time. Yeah. I think there's usually 
a release of liability as well. So that's pretty simple for the county um, application. It's usually just a, a few more extra questions. Um, and then last but not least, through the county, if you're a business applicant, which is what we talked about before, where if you're applying specifically because your business says we want you to carry or you want to carry for your specific company or your line of work, um, they're going to require copies of any business licenses required by local, state, and or federal business and professional codes. Um, they want... Um, you know, like if you're a realtor, they're going to want your real estate license. If you're a financial planner, they're going to want that. You know, if if you work construction, they may ask you just for your construction license, whatever okay. you're, you know, whatever you're licensed in. Um, and they'll probably just make a copy of it and go, okay, cool. Now, if you're working for a firm or a large company, then they're probably, or let's say you're a partnership or a corporate um, office or something, they'll, they may ask for, okay, well, we want a statement providing authorization from your company. They're also going to ask that the letter that, that gives that, the letter containing that statement um, will also state that if the partnership or the relationship or the employee is terminated or it's dissolved in any way, they'll notify the sheriff's department immediately upon okay. that separation. And generally, then you have to re-go through the whole process again to mm. ensure that you can continue to carry. That's why it gets a little sticky. Um, for me, that's why I say if you know your business reason is solid, go for it. But if it's one of those things where you're like, I'm going to change out of this industry in a year, yeah. probably not the best thing to list. Okay, that makes sense. Um, they may ask for empro um, employer authorization on a company letterhead specifying the duties and or assignments which establish the need or the good cause. So why um, is it because you're going out constantly and you're you're working and you're you know so they'll ask you all that again employee letter must state and notify the office immediately upon separation or if the need no longer exists and then any restrictions the employer may wish to impose on the license must also be stated so let's say they say okay yeah you're you're traveling salesman we want you carrying on the road to to defend yourself. But as soon as you come into our corporate office, you got to leave your gun in the car okay. or in a locker. They can specify that, and that will be stated like in your in your license or on on something a packet or something. And that'll be one of the stipulations. And the county is allowed to stipulate whatever they so choose to add to your license if they feel the need to. Since it is a May issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then they may require the employee's last two paycheck stubs or other proof of employ employer employee relationship. So once that's done, all of your applications are pretty much done. Now, again, each county may require some extra stuff here or there, but that's pretty much it. Okay. So after all that's done, then you submit that, and hopefully you get a call for an interview. Wow. Yeah. The, the interview. The interview, yeah, <laughs> and live scan. Um, so you'll be scheduled for an interview with an investigator with the county. Um, backgrounds. And the investigator's typically like a sheriff or... Yeah, if it's with the if it's with the Our department, they're either like a deputy that works for them, um, an investigator, uh, which is similar to like a city detective, mm -hmm. um, or a lot of what they use are like retired police officers that they have come in and take these jobs because they're okay. civilian positions as yeah. well. Um, so a lot of the times you're going to meet with a guy who maybe was on the force for thirty years and retired and now just goes in Tuesdays and Thursdays and does background checks for CCWs and, and for, you know, uh, sheriff's applicants, things like that. So they work for the county as, as like a civilian investigator. Um, your backgrounds will be initiated if they haven't already. And oftentimes that starts as soon as you take your live scan. So if your live scan wasn't ordered already, you'll get ordered your live scan. So the way Riverside used to do it is that they would bring you in, have your interview, issue you your live scan. So then you go and do your live scan. The moment your live scan's done, that initiates your background. Um, some of the online process now is, is getting it so dialed in to where you, you do your live scan ahead of time. They send in the background information to the investigator before you even have your interview, which is super cool. So um, it can be either or. So generally with the interview comes your live scan and your background. Now, during the interview, your investigator will go through the applications that you've submitted. They're going to ensure that they have everything that they need, that the applications are correctly and properly filled out. Um, they'll ask you to uh, all the follow-up questions that they need to. Let's say you answered yes, like I had a traffic violation for this. Well, why? Uh, what was the situation? You know, and they're going to gather all their information about it. And then they're going to research what you're answering too. So okay. if you answer false, then they're going to be like, okay, this guy is lying to me or whatever. Um, 
so then they may require additional information on things that let's say you had you know a uh, issue like with a divorce or something like that where it's uh, there's some court records they're going to ask you probably to provide the court records and okay. and and if you were just, issued a traffic citation we want to see it yeah. you know and just little things like that oh we want to make sure that you paid off all your tickets send us in the proof yeah i think when i was researching the LA county one it, it wanted you to list on the application all the um traffic violations you've had in the last five years yeah um, so. a lot of them are five years seven years they may ask for um the uh, uh the actual uh, incident reports too mm -hmm. like if you were involved in a a traffic accident and um that's you know just one of the one of the things they may ask for as well so yeah uh, <laughs> anyway um i don't know if you guys can hear that we are outside recording as as usual um and there's a lot of music going yeah. in the background <laughs> so um actually we're gonna probably have to wrap this up pretty quickly um anyways you want to go over uh so they review in the interview with your good cause statement yeah they'll review that with you yeah they're gonna so they'll go through after they do all their follow-up questions and the last thing that they'll probably go over with you is your good cause statement yeah they're gonna um they're going to pick it apart too. Like I said, they want to make sure it's specific to you, uh -huh. that it's good for an individual and that it's not just a, you know, a basic statement that is just generalized. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of one of the things that they'll do. Um, after they go through your good cause statement, they may ask you to resubmit it, make it a little more refined, make it a little better. Okay. That's um, cool. The other thing that they're going to do is probably have your permit photos taken. Um, your permit should have it, your photo on it, just like a driver's license. Um, and some agencies actually require passport photos. Oh, really? Yeah. Like they'll have you go down to CVS and like do the passport photos <laughs> like you would if you're going to get a passport photo. Um, and then they'll just use that photo as your permit photo. Okay. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then last but not least towards the very end, if you weren't authorized for training, so the actual eight hour training course, um, then you can, you'll probably be authorized for that. Now, um, there are certain ways that you can do it too. And depending on the County, um, I know Riverside allows you to ask for a pre-approval route. Um, I always recommend this for people who, um, are looking to save a little bit of money because let's say your good cause statement just maybe isn't strong enough, or, um, maybe you have something on your background, like, like divorce or unpaid, um, tickets, you know, just anything where it's not necessarily malicious, but it might hold you up for a little bit. Um, you don't want to be paying hundreds of dollars to go down and do this training yeah. if you're not even having a chance of getting the license. So a lot of people will go and get the training done and then maybe find out, well, you didn't pay two of these tickets. So we feel that, you know, you might need to wait a year or two and prove that you're, you're of good moral character. Um, so that's one of the things where I would say ask if they allow you to ask for a pre-approval before you go to training. All right. Well, so that's pretty good information. We went from basically I want to get my CCW to going through all the um, applications, the county yeah. applications, the uh, California DOJ application. Yep. Um, so uh, we'll cut it there. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll pick it up the, uh, for our next podcast. We'll talk a little bit about the training requirements. Yep. Um, what it, what what the training day looks yeah, like. Yeah. Training day looks like, um, and then we'll talk about just some other things like life with a CCW and um, where, where you can and can't yeah. carry, maybe uh, types of guns to carry, and maybe you know different positions, holsters, that sort of thing. All the logistics. Yeah, logistics. <laughs> so uh, before we 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 end this, let let's go ahead and revisit the the whiskey. Whiskey is good, not as great neat. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Um, actually. For, uh, as far as it being neat, I mean, my ice cube's melted, so it's probably not... Uh, Mine's, mine is neat. Not really neat. Yeah. But, um, you know, th my biggest complaint with the ice cubes was um, flavor almost disappeared completely. It was like, yeah. like drinking water. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, with a little bit of bourbon flavor behind it. Yeah, so there's... Um, I mean, on the rocks, it's it's, it's okay. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not a bad bottom shelf uh, whiskey by any means. Um, I, I would I would definitely drink it over that seventy five South stuff. Oh yeah. Even though it was a little, you know, a couple dollars more. Yeah. Um, yeah. I actually, you know, your your regular um, 
like Jack Daniels, Jim Beam. You know, I, I think this is pretty much there with those. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's bad at all. Yeah. I, th- I think it's probably the best value yeah. uh, whiskey I've, I've had. Yeah. Um, it was surprisingly, it, you know, it's surprisingly really good on its own. Again, like I said, it's it's considered more of a mi- mixing whiskey. You yeah. Know, I, you're going to put it in, in an old fashioned or in a, in a Jack and Coke or something like that. Well, yeah. A um, Grant and Coke. Yeah. I would, I would <laughs> take some Samuel uh, Grant with a little bit of bitters and uh, some ginger ale would probably be pretty good. Oh yeah. Ginger ale would be good. I think it would even go great with like seven up too. So yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, the cigar was pretty good. A little, uh, strong, but could feel the effects a little bit. Yeah. Um, mine wasn't going out nearly as much as yours. Mine, um, I think this one was sitting on the side of the humidor that was much closer <laughs> yeah. to the, uh, the humidity beads. Um, so mine was a lot more damp. I don't know if you noticed, but I was getting a ton more smoke off yeah. of it too. So, and you smoked yours a lot faster than me as it, usual. It really, I, it's strong, but it was not nearly as strong as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So, but delicious, full body flavor, um, Really good. I feel like it smokes like a full body, but it's probably hitting me like maybe more of a medium. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually ex- expected to get um, a little bit of nicotine sickness from this, but I haven't really got. Yeah. That no. At all. Me either. So it's it's. I'm actually really really pleased with this. this. Is an awesome, awesome cigar. So thanks, mom. <laughs> yeah. For that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, uh, we'll go ahead and pick this up uh, on our next episode. Um, hopefully within, uh, you know, or we'll keep, we'll keep up, try to keep another schedule going. It's, yeah. it's kind of hard for us to get together cause we are busy people. Yeah. Um, but follow us, uh, Facebook and Instagram at smoke the podcast. Um, yeah. And you know, give us a like and all that stuff. Um, so this is smoke the podcast signing off. Thank you for listening. Have a good night. Mm-hmm.